in the past from Oklahoma, but certainly a team that knows how to score runs in the first pitch of the game from Tolley is in there for strike one. Now this is a series that goes way back. This is the 109th meeting between these two schools. And even when they weren't conference mates, they would play on Tuesday nights. That one's fouled to the screen. It's 0-2. And it always seemed like something crazy would happen during the course of either a single game on a Tuesday night or a weekend series. And I would expect the same thing to happen here this weekend. The 0-2 from Tolley shot through the right side and a good job of staying on that pitch by John Spikerman. And now you can see why he came into that at bat hitting 419. Yeah, I see Spikerman waste no time here. He gets the breaking ball that's up in the zone and just goes with it the other way. And a guy that's seen a lot of college baseballs, played in the College World Series, was a part of Oklahoma's run a couple of years back and gets things going here. He's also not afraid to run. 9 of 11 stolen bases so far on the year, and that's going to be Oklahoma's M.O. Got a sizable lead over at first base. Cut on and missed. Good pitch from Tolley as he buried that underneath the hands of Bar Bryce Madron, the right fielder. Tolley goes over to first base and chases Spikerman back. Oklahoma a little bit like TCU was last year in that they like to steal bases. Last year had more steals than they had in quite a while. Well, well up over 100 stolen bases last season. Not quite the same speed that they had last year, but still like to put pressure on the defense by starting runners. Yeah, you mentioned that the things that might happen between these two teams. It's because they like to play that aggressive brand of baseball, and you're going to see it on both sides, trying to force the opponent's hand on the defensive side of the ball. Totally missed with that pitch high. He got to 0-2 on Spikerman before leaving the breaking ball up, and Spikerman served it in the right field for the leadoff single. Ahead of Madron here, 1-2. Swinging good pitch from Tolley. And that's the Peyton Tolley that TCU likes to see. Good fastball from Tolley in a good location. Yeah, and it's really been nothing different at all in the first few innings of all of his starts. It's been a heavy fastball attack. He's been putting it over the plate and challenging hitters, and this one's no different. You see, it's over the heart of the plate, just challenging Bryce Madrin, the senior there, and not able to catch up to it. Catcher Easton Carmichael coming up. With a runner at first base. One out now. Throw over and Spike him and able to get back. Carmichael from up the road in Prosper. Hitting 419. He's homered a couple of times. Had a big rip there. Just got a piece of it right in the Carson Blowens glove. Again, Tolley goes over to first base, and right now he's doing a good job of keeping close watch on Spikerman, just letting him know that he's thinking about him over there. Yeah, especially with one out now in the inning, Spikerman going to be doing anything he can to get himself into scoring position, especially with Carmichael, who we talked about how well he's been playing offensively at the plate. Another good pitch from Tolley, and he gets the swing and a miss. See, that fastball gets a ton of swings and misses, especially early in... A lot of times you might think that it's mid-90s, mid to upper 90s with the way that it plays sometimes. Both of these fastballs so far to Carmichael, just 90 miles an hour, but they're playing with a little bit more speed. Foul tip into the glove of Bowen, and he holds on. Back-to-back -back strikeouts after the leadoff single. And it'll be up to Anthony McKenzie to try and move the runner along. Right, and you can even see Easton Carmichael as he's walking back to the dugout saying it's nothing but a fastball. And that's all Tolley has shown that he has to bring out through the first couple of innings in each of his starts. He's going to challenge these hitters and continue to make them hit that fastball. And until they can do it, I wouldn't expect to see anything else. 
Anthony McKenzie at the plate, another throw over. You think it's just because he hides the ball so well and you don't see it till it's out of his hand, making it seem like it's a lot faster than it is? Yeah, you've likely got some of that as well, and spin rate certainly is going to have to come into that as well. If it's a the fastball, might have a little bit of ride, and that's the, that's the term that's being used these days. Carmichael takes a strike. Another fastball. You know, it's tough to explain without actually being in there and, and, <laughs> and witnessing it, but sometimes you've got guys that are throwing 92, 93, and it, it plays a lot harder than that. And you've got a 95-mile-an-hour fastball that's a little bit lighter, but you actually prefer to hit. Another swing and a miss. And we have seen Tolley be, be able to go to that slider as well as the last start at Kansas. It was the best that we had seen the slider from him. Really had a feel for it throughout the four innings that he was in the ballgame. Trying to work around the leadoff base hit, and he does as he strikes out McKenzie. So after giving up the leadoff single, he strikes out the next three batters. No runs to hit a man. Now Peyton Chotnier will lead it off. And he takes the first pitch outside, ball one. Now Chotnier was on the Ole Miss team that defeated Oklahoma in the College World Series you alluded to in the top half of the inning. And you see Chotnier's numbers. He continues to have a lot of success in a Horn Frog uniform, carrying it over from his days at Ole Miss. When he's just proven to be one of those guys who's just a, a, a big time leader on this ball club, even though he's a new face to this team, he's accepted that leadership role for the Horn Frogs. Yeah, he really has done it in every phase of the ball game. Going through a little bit of a skid at the plate right now, which we hadn't seen from him over the first few weeks but it's one he continues to impact the game regardless of how he's actually swinging the bat at any point in time. He's been on base in all 16 games the Horned Frogs have played. Well, 17 games the Horned Frogs have played, so. He's finding ways to get on base even though his average is dipping down just a little bit. And certainly when he, like Spikerman for Oklahoma, when they can get on base to start an inning, that's when things usually go in a positive direction. A little cue shot to first base. Easy chance for McIntyre. The McKenzie has to deal with over at first. First pitch is taken high by Logan Maxwell. Has there ever been a cue shot with like, Spanish or French or anything? <laughs> It's going to be a long weekend if you're bringing that out right now on the bottom of the first. See what Maxwell's done so far. 434 for the year. and We, we talked about it the other night at DBU. This is a guy who, when he's healthy, is an extremely productive offensive player. We saw it in the middle part of last year, tail end of last year, when he was 100% so far this year. He's picked up right where he left off as he fouls that one off the mask of the catcher, Carmichael. Now, if you followed Horn Frog baseball at all over the last couple of years, you've seen the flashes from Maxwell, and you just alluded to a couple of those periods where he's been dead on. There have been times, though, where he's been just a bit behind, a bit ahead, and you mentioned the injury bug, but he really has put it all together through the first month or so of this season. It's been really impressive to watch him. He's staying on breaking pitches the other way. He's on time to fastballs to the pull side. He's been a really consistent offensive performer and right in the middle of that TCU lineup all season. Drives this one towards the gap in right center field, but it's going to hang in the air. Madrin, the right fielder, able to run over and make the catch. They had to play pretty well, but that ball had a lot of air underneath it. Okay, see Davis goes to the breaking ball here. It looks like Maxwell just gets it off the end of the bat. He's a little out in front. And not able to get everything on it. Madrin able to range over and make the play. Too good at bats to start the game for Braden Davis on the mound for Oklahoma. Here's Curtis Byrne. Takes the strike. Going over at first base tonight for the Horned Frogs. The St. Louis, Missouri native. Good senior campaign, 294, a couple of home runs. And you got to credit. Curtis and Carson Bowen for that matter 
making the adjustment to catching and playing first base, a position that really neither one of them had played before, and making that transition and, and doing it pretty well. I mean, they've you know, made a few mistakes where they might have gone for balls they shouldn't have or whatnot, but for the most part, they've played pretty clean over there. Curtis lays off the off-speed pitch. The outfield shading around towards right for Curtis Byrne, who swings over the top of Michael Schneider. Takes a first pitch down and in for ball one. Now that one back. Let's see if Tolley sticks with the fastball here in the second inning. A lot of success in inning number one with it. Schneider out of Woodland Hills, California. Leads the uh, Sooners in the lineup tonight with three home runs. You know, was one of the things, you know, looking at this game, I think I was most surprised at is that TCU has more total home runs than Oklahoma, which is not something we normally see from an Oklahoma ball club and goes after a pitch that was up above the letters and strikes out. That's four straight strikeouts for Toldy. Toldy struck out three in a row after giving up the leadoff single last inning and strikes out Schneider to start this lineup and Toldy going back into the dugout here after that first inning slips and falls and fortunately for TCU he appears to be okay. Coming back to the mound, he did have a little hamstring problem last week up in Kansas. That ball bunted foul down the third base line. Yeah, it's, it, those dugouts, they can get you. And, you know, he's got, well, I'm serious. You know, everybody's wearing spikes, and, yep. you know, each dugout's different. You've got, now you're in, at your home field, so. But it's, it is certain. we were standing in there before the game. It's certainly wet down there and a slippery, slurf, slippery surface when you've got those metal cleats on. And it's field turf right up until you get to the concrete. Swing and a miss. There's nothing in two on Jackson Nicholas, the second baseman. And on top of that, you know, the, the team, his teammates were high-fiving him. He might not have seen where the step is. It's just down at about six inches or eight inches to step into the dugout. It can happen. Fortunately, he didn't get hurt. That's the most important thing. That pitch almost hit him as he had to jackknife out of the way. Went to the fastball. Had a little more velocity on it, but missed inside. Foul back. You know, Toley's other starts, when he's working from the windup in the beginning of the game, he, he seems to have really good command coming out of the bullpen. It's when he's forced to go to the stretch, although last inning he didn't, well, wasn't bothered by that at all after Spikeman got on. Fouled out of play, which is a good sign for TCU fans. That one ends up behind the TCU dugout. That's the easiest way to pick them up is after they uh, bounce around on the dugout top a little bit. I always laugh when you see the foul balls going to the stands. There's like eight people standing around wanting to catch it. And then as it gets close, they're like, you know what? Maybe not. Oh, it starts moving pretty quickly to that, to that bare hand. <laughs> Fouled off over the roof on the left side. Totally continues to pound the strike zone here. As the sun peeks through the clouds. Got him swinging. Nice pitch from Tolley. You know, he mentioned it a little bit ago, but 
Last weekend, Lawrence really looked like Tolley had great feel for the slider, and this is a good one here to Jackson Nicholas. He starts it right on the inside part of the plate. It continues to just sweep across. And able to get the junior second baseman to swing right through that one. Tolley in the groove with the strikeout. Now five here in the ballgame. And he starts Kendall Pettis off with a pitch on the corner for strike one. The left fielder takes outside. Pettis out of Chicago, Illinois. Hitting 302, he's homered a couple of times. Told he missed. With the fastball. He's got a couple of more miles an hour on the fastball here in this inning. That one's up to 92. Casey Moser not snapping the right hand up. The crowd wanted it. I think Tolley thought it was on the corner, but the only person who has the opinion in the ballpark that matters said it was outside. Popped up on the infield. The wind carrying it towards second base. Peyton Chatnier. Charlos Davlon hoping their starter can get deep into the ball game here tonight. He saw Peyton Tolley Joined by Dave Lawn on top of the dugout there as they're the two of them talking things over. And you know, Dave Lawn has become such a integral part of this coaching staff, even though he's only been here a short period of time. The pitchers really trust him. And are really beginning to uh, kind of I don't want to say buy into what he's telling them, but certainly much more comfortable with the way he goes about teaching the pitchers. See them both talking about the situations and the batters and what they want to do and whatnot. Back to action here. Leading things off with the Horn Frogs, the designated hitter Jack Basier. Getting the nod, the sophomore out of Pleasanton, California. Got off to a really hot start when he was inserted into the lineup earlier at third base. And hasn't had a whole lot of opportunity with Ryder Robinson doing what he's been doing over at third base, kind of putting a, a clamp on that position. So guys like Basir and Brody Green having to fight for at-bats when they get an opportunity. Obviously, as a coaching staff, it's uh, something you like to have is a bunch of different options out there. Basir strikes out. Second straight strikeout. Now look like a changeup. Yeah, it was a really good one in from Davis and those, especially those right-handed hitting horn frogs you're going to see a lot of these tonight you see the grip in the glove there and starts it on the outside part of the plate and has it just fade right away and as a hitter if you don't see that immediately out of the hand you start to swing as if it's a fastball no chance to make any contact there swing and a miss by Anthony Silva Silva hitting 306 with a home run. Ask Kirk Sarlos about Silva's little bit of struggles. Him and Carson Bone, who are, is on the in the on deck circle, both of them not hitting the way we saw them hit, especially at the back end of last year on that great run to the College World Series for the Horn Frog. And he said, you know, we've seen flashes of both of them doing what they did. He said, I think they're just putting so much pressure on themselves. He said, those two guys work as hard as anybody. They're in the cage all the time. Maybe too much. That they're just trying so hard to uh, you know, be the, be the man in the lineup. And he said, we saw that with Braden Taylor a little bit last year, you know, where he was really pressing in the early part. And then once he just started to have fun, let it all go, things clicked for him. And he said, I think that's going to be the same thing for Silva and Bo and as we progress through the season. And you see this all over the place, but especially after you set the bar so high as a freshman, very hard to replicate, especially when you've got those expectations, and not only from others, but on, your, on yourself that you're placing. You see Silva takes down, and he'll 
find his way over to first base via the walk. Well, you had a great freshman year and then didn't quite have the sophomore season you were hoping for. Did you put a little extra pressure on yourself or was it? Well, this let me. This was not, certainly not a cue to talk about this. But <laughs> no, we, no, but, no. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't an insult. I was no, you're, it's, you're exactly right. It is very hard to do. You, you go out there and then, you know, all the accolades that both of these two, and there are plenty of others across the country in the same boat as well, but you, you set it up like, that way. And, okay, so that's the bar, and that's what you're going out to do. And when you do face a little bit of adver adversity, there's tape out there on you, and, you know, opposing pitching staffs and coaching staffs have an entire year to game plan for you. And see, it certainly does change. You've got to adapt and grow as well. And, and I would imagine when you don't have success, it just gets into your psyche almost. You're like, well, I got to do this or I got to do more or work harder or do, you know, do all these things. And, and you know better than me. Baseball, you just can't play with all that stuff going no, around. I, in your head. Everybody that's ever played the game knows if you're if you're going up there and trying to hit against a guy like Braden Davis on the mound right now, and you're thinking about, all right, I've got to go five for my next seven to get my average back to X, and it just it's no way to play the game. Especially now that both of these teams are into conference play, and the pitching is going to continue to be great, night in and night out. Silva board over at first base. Chase back with a throw. Silver four out of five in stolen bases. Base stealing guru Evan Scoud giving him some tips. You couldn't even say that with a straight face, <laughs> could you? <laughs> it was hard. <laughs> There's Evan, all-time great, one of the all-time greats here at TCU. Swing and a miss by Carson Bowen, and you can see Bowen after that swing and a miss coming out of the batter's box, talking to himself just a little bit. And Davis has been really effective so far of pulling that string. Here's the 2-2. Two -two. Shot down the right field line. That's going to get down and go all the way to the fence. Slipping and falling is Madrin. Racing around third and being held up by John DeLora is Silva. And a great job of hitting by Carson Bowen as he stayed on that pitch. He did not give up on it this time. And lines it down the right field line for a double. Well, it's just a really good job of hanging in there by Bowen. You get another look at a pitch. It's a fastball that's up and over the outer part of the plate. And this is a pitch that Carson Bowen handles so well. He gets a look at how wet the field is out there. Madrin losing his feet out in right field. And Silva got a great read on this ball. Thought he was going to have a great chance to score, but there's one out in the inning. You're going to give Ryder Robinson a chance here with two men in scoring position after the double by Carson Bowen. Foul the first offering back to the screen. And John Delora was three quarters of the way to home plate when he threw up that stop sign. He was way down the line making sure that Silva saw him. And Silva did the right thing. He was full speed ahead. He was not thinking about anything but scoring until he saw the arms go up. That one was shot foul. But now it's up to Robinson. He's got to find a way to put the ball in play here. The infield is back, so Oklahoma will give up a run on a ground ball. Obviously, a fly ball to the outfield to get the job done as well. And an opportunity for TC to break out on top here in the second inning. Well, that's a big spot for the freshman to be in as well. And, you know, part of what TCU had had so much success doing was situational baseball that got them off to the best start in program history. Situations like this. In the air, down the right field line. This is playable as Madrin makes the catch on the warning track. Tagging and scoring from third is Silva. And moving over to third is Bowen. It's 1-0 TCU on the sack fly off the bat of the freshman rider Robinson. That's yeah, a really good job after falling down into the count 0-2. 
against somebody who's really got the secondary stuff going like Davis as we've seen so far tonight. It's a pitch that Davis really lets go of high. He didn't necessarily want that pitch to be up there. Robinson able to put a good charge into it to deep right field into the corner and, and it doesn't look like much but that's a really nice play out and right by Madrin to stay with that ball after what we just saw the play prior how wet it is out there man he had to be a little worried about his footing once he hit that warning track did a really nice job of staying with it and then the ball kind of drifted back over his head still able to make the catch Chase Brunson at the plate for the Horned Frogs The freshman hitting 339 on the year. Got off to a torrid start. Has since cooled off just a little bit. And San Clemente, California. And the three home runs, all of them coming early. Also had a, a lot of doubles. Four of them early on. He scalded some baseballs his first couple of weeks in the lineup that impressed both you and I. He has since cooled off just a little bit. There's a start. And as you referenced, you know, for the first couple of weeks, being a freshman, nobody had any tape on him. Nobody knew what he was about. And all of a sudden, he started seeing a lot more off-speed stuff and then fewer and fewer fastballs. That ball ripped foul. Yeah, it's because he was hitting everything like that, too. And I, and I distinctly remember that same... You know, same day that I got that lesson, it was against Vanderbilt in Dodger Stadium. And you know, get off to a great start where you're hitting a lot of fastballs and because that's all you're seeing. And then you get a, a staff like that, and that was a pretty good one that year as well. And you start seeing everything but a fastball. And foul down the right field line. And you can see right there, great mix of pitches there by Davis. He went soft, and then he went hard, and he got the really late swing by Chase Brunson. 10 mile an hour difference between those last two pitches. Strike three called on the inside corner. Brunson thought it was inside, but doesn't get the call. But TCU breaks out on top. They pick up winning, so he's in good shape pitch count wise. And the first pitch of the at bat to Carter Frederick, the designated hitter, misses a low ball one. Lined right at Peyton Chatnier. It's probably the best hit baseball off of Tolly so far in this game. Yeah, it's bad luck for Carter Frederick. That ball's tattooed and had right center field written all over it, just right into the glove of Peyton Chatnier. Nine hole hitter, Jackson Willett. The shortstop at the plate takes ball one. Willits at a Fort Cobb, Oklahoma. And speaking of Oklahoma, Peyton Tolley, an Oklahoma native. The Sooners were really hoping that Tolley, when he transferred from Wichita State, would come home and play in Norman. But after visiting on the phone with Kirk Sarlos and then coming down to the TCU campus, he said he felt at home almost immediately upon arriving here. And he said it made his decision pretty easy. He's at a Yukon, Oklahoma. Big swing and a miss. Two and two now on Willits. In the air, foul down the right field line. Long run for Boyers, and Boyers stays with it, slipping and sliding on that turf, able to make the catch. I feel like we see it every week with Boyers out in right field, but he continues to show, especially in games here at Lupton Stadium, how well he knows the field and the playing surface. Spent a lot of time out there in right field 
We've continued to see him get more and more comfortable out there with those reads. He's really made himself into a very good right fielder. Top of the order, John Spikerman. Takes the first pitch for a ball. Spikerman lined a single through the right side of the infield. His first time up has the only hit of the game so far for Oklahoma, and it came after his down in the count, 0-2. Let's see if Tolley attacks him the same way second time around. First time through, as you talked about, it was pretty much just fastball. Spikerman. Hits it hard to straightaway center field. Brunson on the run, makes the catch. Had to leap at the last second. We're able to make the leap and corral that baseball as he comes down. And that saves a few bases for the Horn Frogs because John Spikerman can fly and have third base in his sights. It's sure a double, probably, as you said, even a triple for Spikerman to the deepest part of the ballpark. Luke Boyer's leading it off with a line drive to left center field. It's going to dunk in for a base hit. We talked about it when we referred to the lineup at the top of the broadcast, but having Boyer's now in the nine hole essentially gives you two leadoff hitters with how well he can run and Chatagnier, who's coming up next. Especially when he's, when he's being aggressive early in count. See, this is a fastball that's away from him, and he just gets, it, gets enough of it off the end of the bat to dunk it into shallow center field here, but you're exactly right. Now you get a man on the first base who we know to be aggressive, and we'll see which buttons T.J. Bruce and the TCU offense elect to push here. Try and extend their 1-0 lead. Peyton Chatagnier at the plate now. Hey, pitch on the inside corner. So far, home plate umpire Casey Mosier is giving that inside corner to the pitchers. A lot of these pitchers pitches are right on that uh, black part of the home plate. Warriors chase back with a throw. Warriors doesn't uh, wear the oven mitt, does he? So many players today going with the oven mitt. In fact, he has no gloves on at all over there. Everybody's got their own style. Yep. They didn't have the oven mitt when you played or when I played. <laughs> they they did. I am not that old. <laughs> Sky to right field. Easy chance for Madrin, and he makes the catch. I just don't remember them being that popular back then. They were a, uh, we were just a subtler era. <laughs> That's one. Maybe I'll put it that way. Okay. I'll go with it. I'll go with it. Ripped. And caught. It's going to be turned into a double play by McKenzie, who takes an extra base hit away from Logan Maxwell and turns it into. Ball was headed into the right field corner. He turned it into a inning ending double play. It shows you how thin the margins are when you get two teams like this into Big 12 play. Bryce Madrin, the right fielder at the plate. Totally deals a strike to even things up with a ball and a strike. The lone run of the game coming for the Horn Frogs in the second. Madrin 0 for 1, struck out his first time to the plate. And totally going with a lot more of the breaking balls here. Second time around. And you can see he just continues to be comfortable with it. <laughs> Lifted off on the left side and out of play. You know, we talked at the top of the broadcast about how long this rivalry is, 109 games. It actually goes all the way back to 1942. And the first time they played, and for the most part, they've played at least once a year since then. 
Obviously, in the last 10 years, of members of the Big 12 have played three or four times a year, depending upon whether they met in postseason tournament play. But uh, even in the years prior to being members of the Big 12, they would play on Tuesday nights, usually once up in Norman and once down here. It'll be interesting to see. That one is lined and off the glove of Silva, who was shaded up the middle, and it had to move to his right, could not come up with it on the leap. And it's a leadoff single for Madrin. Off the bat, I thought Silva might have a chance. Yeah, I agree with you. And you see, Madrin's choked up a little bit, and he just stays on this one. It's a fastball from Tolley. It's on the outer part of the plate, and it's exactly what you have to do as a left-handed hitter to approach that pitch. So Madrin was one of the strikeout victims earlier. Makes the adjustment the second time around, just out of the reach of Anthony Silva. Catcher Easton Carmichael coming up now with a runner at first, nobody out. He's off the breaking ball. Oh, for one for Carmichael. He was a strikeout victim his first time up. Totally struck out five in a row in the first and second inning. Clipped the inside corner. And leaving it up at one and one. Big lead over at first base by Madrin. Does not have a stolen base. That one's foul back. Kind of daring Tolley to throw over there. First game of three this weekend between TCU and OU. On the ground to third. Could be two. They go to second for one. Over to first. Not in time. As uh, Madrin able, or excuse me, Carmichael able to beat that out. Wasn't hit that hard. Tough to go all the way around the horn, but Chatnier tried to make the back end of the double play. Now you see Carmichael choked up high up onto the bat, just trying to make contact. You see how far around this ball has to go to try and turn two. And first base umpire Michael Banks right on top of it. You see Carmichael getting in there by about a half step. A good turn by TCU. Just such a long throw from Ryder Robinson at true third base there to get that started. No chance for the double play. So one out, runner at first. For Anthony McKenzie, who has to skip rope to stay out of the way of that pitch at his feet. Oh for one for McKenzie. He was a strikeout victim in the first. Caught looking to end the inning. Now Carmichael, the catcher, does have a couple of stolen bases, and that's why Peyton Tolley's paying attention to him over there. He's two for four. Sooners get some pretty sizable leads over at first base. Unlike the way TCU goes about taking their lead where they kind of roll into those, it looks more like Oklahoma's got those kind of one-way leads where they get way off, but they're leaning sort of back. There he goes. Pitch is taken for a ball. Throw down to second, not nearly in time. He picked a good pitch to run on and got a good jump. Now it just tells you there are more than one way to do it, and you're exactly right. This is a massive lead to start for Carmichael. He gets a great jump on this ball, and it is a tough one to throw on for Bowen as it brings him really into the hitter there, McKenzie. A tying run out at second base now, and a 3-0 count. He was fouled off. He went after the 3-0 pitch, fouled it over the roof on the right side. Now we told you both of these teams are going to be aggressive. Yeah. 
really good breaking ball from Tolley as he was able to get it over the inside corner. Yeah, and it's a nice job countering that 3-0 swing. Come back in with a breaking ball. He got McKenzie in the box. He's shown the level of aggression that he's going to bring to the at-bat. So flip a breaking ball in there and get yourself to a full count. Off the screen. It'll stay full, three and two. Tying run and scoring position for Oklahoma. We're here in the top half of the fourth inning. Only one out. Got him looking. And Carmichael, or McKenzie rather, knew it as he was headed to the dugout before that ball was even in Carson Bowen's glove. That's just a great pitch by Peyton Tolley. Yeah, just a really good job of staying in the count. And see he goes to the back door here. And it looks like McKenzie's thinking that ball's outside. But that back door breaker, especially on a full count, is so tough to pull the trigger on. Everything in your mind is telling you that it's away. Well, Casey Mosier rings him up, and now there are two outs. Michael Schneider at the plate. And he starts him off with an off-speed pitch for a strike one. Six strikeouts now for Tolley. Schneider was one of them. Back in the second inning. Good idea. Stayed away with the breaking ball and then tried to bust him inside with the fastball. Let's see what Tolley goes to here. In the air, right field. This one's deep, going back as Boyers. He leaps, can't make the catch. That ball's over the wall. A two-run home run for Oklahoma. And the Sooners have taken a two-to-one lead just when it looked like Tolley and the Frogs would be out of the inning. Schneider delivers his fourth home run of the year, an opposite field job, and the Sooners have the lead. I see Snyder gets a great swing off this ball. It's a fastball that's up, very similar to the double that we saw earlier from Bowen, but Snyder able to elevate this ball a little bit to the right side. I thought Luke Boyers was going to have an opportunity at this one. You see it just sneaks over that right field wall. The jump's a little bit early. But either way, Snyder able to give the Sooners the lead here in the top of the fourth. So totally touched up for the two-run home run. Jack Jackson Nicholas. Takes the first pitch for ball one. It looked like Tolley was going to get out of the inning, but a good swing by Schneider. Was, and his first time up mentioned that he's the team leader, at least in the lineup tonight, with three home runs. He's now got four. And those RBIs, number 25 and 26 on the season for Schneider. So he's been a guy that's continued to produce offensively for Skip Johnson's club. Well, now totally trying to come back here. After giving up the home run, spins a breaking ball that misses outside. Ball carrying pretty well the right field. There's a little bit of breeze blowing out that way, but not much. We've seen a couple of balls. Carson Bowen's ball, the ball that was also off the bat of Robinson that carried pretty well. Get a look at the flags, barely moving on the flagpole out there and left. But the ball seems to be carrying in that direction. Breaking ball, full count. Swinging 2012, but all time Oklahoma with the series lead 66 to 42. So it will be interesting to see if these two teams entertain any non conference discussions moving forward, given the proximity, not too far of a drive between the two. TCU 11 and 
They're 12 and 11 here at Lupton Stadium, but they lost the series two games to one last time Oklahoma was here. Line to center field. That's a base hit for Curtis Boone. Oklahoma's won the last two series. They took two out of three from TCU last year up in Norman and the year before here at Lupton Stadium. So kind of swings back and forth. We get another look at the swing by Curtis Byrne. Now this one crushed by Byrne back up the middle and Oklahoma's fortunate that this ball didn't have any lift on it. Otherwise very well could be a tie ball game. Byrne staying on a breaking ball there from Davis to get things going in the home half of the fourth. Jack Basier takes the first pitch for ball one. Shot foul down the right field line. Madrin was playing Basier in the gap in right center field. That was a long way for him to try and go. He never got close to it. 0 for 1 for Basir. He led off the second by striking out. One hopper right back to the box. They go to second for one. Over to first. Double play. Second double play the Horn Frogs have hit into here in this game. And that was done nicely by the pitcher, Davis, who barely hit the ground before throwing this ball to second base. Yeah, Braden Davis fortunate that this one ends up the way that it does because it's certainly not the textbook fundamentals on how to turn. You see, kind of gets spun around the wrong way, steps with the wrong leg and is thrown off balance, but he's able to get enough muscle there and a nice play by the shortstop Willits to stick with that, pick it out of the dirt and make a strong throw to first base. Just like that, the leadoff single erased. Anthony Silva with a walk tonight. At the plate now with the bases empty, two away. Fouls it. Over the roof on the right side, out of play. First game of a three-game series here this weekend. Tomorrow, the game will start at 5 p.m. So if you're thinking of coming out to Lupton Stadium, be sure and take note of the, the different start time. That's because there's a track meet going on in the track facility just off behind the third base side here. And uh, you can't hold the track meet and the baseball game at the same time. Not so much for the fans, but baseballs fly like that last one will fly into the track. And Silva takes low for a ball and it's 2-1. And so for safety reasons, you can't, <laughs> can't be doing... Yeah, that'd be a really fun way to finish the 300-meter hurdles. <laughs> Time is called, a mound visit coming up. As if that race wouldn't be, isn't hard enough already. <laughs> You're huffing coming around the last, well, for, for your last attempt at a hurdle. You're having to dodge a fastball coming at your head from the sky. 60 pitches so far for Davis in the contest. So he's probably still well within where he wants to be. This is just a visit to talk about strategy or settle him down just a little bit. And a time and a half through the order so far for Braden Davis. He's looked really good. We've seen some great change-ups from him, especially to those right-handed Horn Frog hitters. A 3-1 count on Silva. Full count, took a fastball in the inside corner. I'm talking about being pelted by baseballs while running around the track. It's like baseball sized hail coming down. You don't even see it till it's on top of you. Ball four and another walk for Silva. So Silva's seen the ball well tonight. Draws his second walk. 
TC with the runner at first base, two away from Carson Bowen. First pitch for strike one. He started him off with something off speed. Carson picked up his third double of the year. His last time up as he lined one down the right field line. Throw over the first base and Silver is back. And we've seen a couple of those kind of awkward throws from Davis. Kind of like he made out to second base where he doesn't really step. He just throws with it all arm over the first base. He's trying to let Silva know he's thinking about him. Oh, and swings and misses. Nothing in two on Carson Bowen. You can see Bowen telling himself to stay on that pitch. And now a couple of off-speed pitches in, and if you're Davis, you can do whatever you want to do here. Do not have to give Bowen anything over the plate. Him up right side foul territory. McKenzie in foul ground makes the catch in the inning. Who can, who can execute down the stretch? The big blow, of course, in this game, giving the Sooners the two to one lead off the bat of Michael Schneider, his fourth home run. That's a team leading fourth home run, and he's one of the leading RBI guys in the Big 12. Guys, third in the Big 12 now, up to 26. He's continuing to produce the plate and be a value for Skip Johnson on the offensive side. Leading off for the Sooners here, the bottom third of the order, Kendall Pettis, the left fielder. Takes a strike from Tolley, and that's Tolley's seventh strikeout of the night. Now Peyton Tolley continuing to feel it, and you know, had to come out of the game a little earlier than he would have liked last week because of that injury that you alluded to, dealing with a little bit of a lower body issue but right now he's looking as comfortable as ever opportunity for Tolley to get as deep into the game as we've seen him so far in a Friday night start which is exactly what Kirk Sarlos had been alluding to and hoping for from Tolley. Correction that's his eighth strikeout of the night. There's the back there breaking ball here but misses wide to Carter Frederick the designated hitter. Frederick goes for one lined sharply to Chatnier his first time up. And Tolly really seems to have good command of all three pitches tonight. We've seen him have the good fastball through every start, but tonight the mix seems to be extremely consistent. He's able to throw all three of them for strikes when he wants to. Boy, if, if this is the Peyton Tolly that TCU sees from here on out, he's, turn, he'll turn, he's turning himself into a legitimate Friday night guy in the Big 12. Uh, you, you're exactly right. You, you know, this is a new role for him. It's something we've talked about before, but you have to learn how to get into that Friday night starter mentality. You know, you're setting everything up for the rest of the weekend. And oftentimes, you know, win or lose sometimes, your team's measure of success over the weekend is dependent upon how deep you can get into the game. And Tolley has only gotten through five full innings once. We'll see if he's able to do it here tonight. Shot in the eight, charging, able to unload. And there are two away. A nice play by Shot in the eight. And another good pitch from Tolley as he had Frederick off balance. And he's doing a good job of just not letting these sooner hitters get comfortable and really just the one mistake and if you want to call it that it was a pitch that was up but Snyder went and got it and rode it out to right field. Nine hole hitter shortstop Jackson Willits the plate takes ball one. Willits 0 for 1 fouled out to Boyers in right field his first time to the plate. 
That came back in the third inning. And both of these starters on the other side, Braden Davis has been pitching lights out as well. So this is not just a, a Peyton Tolley night. Davis may not have the strikeouts that Tolley has, but he's been effective keeping TCU off balance. Just three hits apiece in this game. So both pitchers really dealing here this evening. And there's another strikeout for Tolley. And they've had the opportunity to so far. Really just one hit between the two teams with two outs. Ryder Robinson takes ball one. DC third baseman drove in the only run of the game for the Horn Frogs with a sacrifice fly back in the second. Both pitchers really work in the corners nicely here tonight. Going in and out, changing speeds. Robinson lays off that fastball at 92 that was up and away. Bottom third of the TC batting order here. In the fifth. Robinson laying off those last two fastballs that were up and away. Now most everything's going to that arm side, especially as we've gotten into the middle portion of this ball game for Davis with eight right-handed hitters in the lineup for the Horn Frogs. That'll be something that they'll need to look for and watch. Maybe stay on a baseball, go the other way. As Ryder Robinson watches that one float too far outside. He'll make his way down to first and lead things off in the fifth. Oklahoma does have somebody in their bullpen. The right-hander has just gotten up and begun to throw with the football. <laughs> now pick, pick up the baseball. If you are wondering if that's normal, it is. That is something that, that pitchers and bullpens do across the country. First pitch in for a strike to Chase Brunson. Do they have to catch with running routes or do they just play catch? I, I cannot opine on the life of a, of a bullpen pitcher. It's different. Yeah. That's a fact. The pitch missed outside. Brunson struck out looking his only time to the plate. That came all the way back in the second. Throw over the first and Ryder Robinson able to get back. You know, I think if we panned to a bullpen and we saw a catcher running routes, that catcher may not be on the flight home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not. Foul back by Brent. You know, it makes sense. It's kind of like throwing a weighted ball. They'll throw sometimes. You'll see that kind of extra heavy. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly what it's intended to be used for. The ball and two strikes on Chase Brunson. Robinson without a stolen base, inching his way off the bag at first. Not going, and Brunson takes a fastball away. And all of a sudden, in this inning, it looks like Davis is having some problems with his release point on that fastball. And you can see it's just every so often starting to leak out there to that arm side into the third, into the left-handed batter's box. Brunson fights it off and fouls it to the screen. able to spoil a good pitch from Davis. So a battle going on here between Davis and Brunson.
Robinson the tying run on at first base for the Horn Frogs. They throw in his direction, the chasing back. TC was not attempted a stolen base tonight. They've hit into a couple of double plays. This ball shot foul down the right field line. A little bit better swing that time, and that'll end up in the Oklahoma bullpen. Down and right. See, even that pitch, though, gets in on Brunson a little bit. And he's wanting to protect against that off-speed stuff away. Brunson able to get back standing up. In the dirt, goes all the way back to the backstop, and that will allow Ryder Robinson to jog to second base on the wild pitch. Fourth wild pitch of the year thrown by Davis, and that's a big one because it gets a tying run in the scoring position. Now, I've said this a few times already tonight, but for TCU, the theme of the season offensively has been opportunistic offense, and they've really done a good job of taking advantage when those situations present themselves. And here you go now, you've got a runner in scoring position and nobody out. And Robinson draws a walk. And that's a really solid at bat uh, by Brunson. As uh, he is able to draw the walk after falling behind in the count. Yeah, he looked uncomfortable in his first at bat and you see Davis got in on him a couple times at this one as well, but able to fight those pitches off and make his way to first base. And now you've got an opportunity if you're able to move some runners around, keep the traffic out there, and come up with a big hit to change the complexion of this game. Luke Boyers will bat as you take a look at the right-hander. Kaysen Witherspoon loosening up in the bullpen. With this spoon appear left center field, batting from the right side his first time up, leading off the third inning. But he was erased on a double play later on in the frame. That ball is bunted, foul down the third base line, and Boyers looked like he was trying to get out of the way of it rather than get the bunt down. Yeah, that's one that you square around, and then you get 96 just barreling in on your hands. Almost freezes you, you get a little bit handcuffed. See if Boyers is asked to bunt here. He does square around early against Witherspoon. Gets the bunt down. Good bunt. This will advance the runners. The only play is the first. They get the out, but the sacrifice is successful, and that's a great bunt by Luke Boyers. Well, kids, if you're watching this and you hear your youth coach ever say, catch the baseball, that's what you want to do with the bunt. This is exactly it. You see Boyers gets on top of that ball, not necessarily in the best area, but because he deadens it enough, that's a 96-mile-an-hour fastball. He's able to slow down like that. Witherspoon makes the right play and gets the out at first base, but now here's TCU in that opportunistic situation. A couple of men in scoring position now. And just one out in the inning. Top of the order, Peyton Chatnier at the plate. First pitch swinging, pops it up on the infield. And that's not what Chatnier wanted. It'll be caught by the shortstop, Willits. And Chatnier. There Chatnier's been, and he's really been a spark plug at the top part of that lineup. It's just been a little bit of that rut for the senior. Well, now it's left up to Logan Maxwell with two outs and two on. Maxwell late on the fastball at 96 miles an hour. Maxwell smoked the line drive right at the first baseman, McIntyre, or McKenzie rather, his first time up. He turned it into a double play and he ropes this one into right field for a base hit. Two runs will score. TCU retakes the lead. A big turn by Maxwell over at first base. And he'll hold on. And Logan Maxwell continues to swing a torrid bat for these Horn Frogs. 
Well, Maxwell got absolutely robbed of one back in his last at bat, but this one he's able to line into right field. And when TCU needed somebody to come through here in this situation, two men on and two out, it's none other than Logan Maxwell, who's been the guy in the middle part of the lineup for the Horn Frogs all year. He continues to swing that hot bat. Maxwell getting it done, giving the Horn Frogs the lead here in the fifth. Maxwell aboard. Over at first base now. That pitch is low and outside to Curtis Byrne. You talked about Maxwell at the top of the broadcast and how good he's been really since day one of this season. Yeah, he's just been outstanding and really the most consistent bat for the Horn Frogs. That hit there extends his hitting streak to 18 games now. Picks up two RBIs with that base hit. Maxwell now dancing around over at first base and Byrne takes a strike. But he went to the slider there. Got the call up in the strike zone. And it's one and one on Curtis Byrne. He's got a single tonight. He's one for two. Singled up the middle his last time up. Struck out all the way back in the first. Maxwell able to get back and that was a good move by Witherspoon. Maxwell was leaning just a little bit. Just able to get the hand back ahead of the tag by McKenzie. There goes Maxwell and that pitch is fouled off. Maxwell would have had second base stolen. But that pitch looked pretty good to Curtis Burns, so he went after it. Maxwell, four out of five in stolen bases on the year. Shot through the right side for a base hit. Maxwell slips going around second, has to put on the brakes. And another good piece of hitting by Curtis Byrne. He gets his average back up over 300 with his two hits tonight. And it's the second breaking ball that we've seen Byrne put a great swing on. Took the last one and put it right back up the middle in his last at bat. But this one he shoots it through the right side. You see Maxwell tripping himself up a little bit there. Probably not the worst thing in the world. I don't think he had third base with as hard as that ball was hit into right and how quickly that Madrin got to it. So an opportunity for TC to extend the lead here. Jack Basir goes after the first pitch and gums up empty. Started him off with a slider. Easton Carmichael out in front of the plate. 0 for 2 for Basir. He has struck out, bounced into a double play his last time up. Clipped the corner with a breaking ball. Nothing and 2 on Basir now. Sears thing, where's that 96 mile an hour fastball you've been dealing to everybody? There it is, it's in the dirt. Maxwell started towards third, but a nice play by Carmichael behind the plate to keep it in front of him and prevent Maxwell from advancing 90 feet with two outs. Really no point from Maxwell to try and get there. Well, it's a heck of a job by Carmichael behind the plate on this ball. This one's spiked. When you've got a slider that's coming in with some velocity as well. Just makes it that much tougher to corral as a catcher. And Carmichael just putting his chest on that one. And really, there's no room at all to try and advance. The ball and two strikes on Basir. Hit on the ground. Nice play made by McKenzie on the bat. 83 pitches for the left-hander. He struck out nine. And he's really been on his game as the first batter of the inning is the leadoff hitter, John Spikerman. Takes the first pitch for ball one after showing bunt. Spikerman, one for two, has a single. 
hit the ball to deep center field his last time up, and it was just a nice play by Brunson to prevent him from getting at least a double, probably a triple. I mean, this is a guy for TCU with the lead now. You want to keep him off the base paths because he can flat out fly. Chomped into the ground foul, and he can hit too. 422 for Spikerman. And in case you're wondering, he's got 64 at bats and 27 hits. So it's not like uh, it's the first weekend of the season and he's hitting a lofty 422. This ball's to deep left center field. Going back is Maxwell on the run. He makes the catch in front of the fence for the out. And Spikerman again squaring up a pitch from Peyton Toley. Uh, Maxwell has to run a long way to get to this one in deep left center field, but the Horn Frogs fortunate that Spikerman shortened up. He's choked up and in a bit of a shortened approach here. No real leg kick as he had been doing earlier in the count. You know, facing two strikes, he wants to try and quicken things up, and that short swing keeps this ball in the yard. Bryce Madrin takes the first pitch for ball on. The sooner right fielder. That's a base hit tonight. Ball and a strike on Madrin. Madrin's base hit came his last time up in the fourth inning. He's also struck out. Shows Bunt, tries to bunt it, but bunts it foul. up on the pitch aim for the mid inside corner I'm not sure where it missed yeah it's a really good spot by Tolley especially with two strikes does look like it's just a shade in but that's a close one to take if you're Madrin with two goes up and in here and now the counts four three and two and you can see Tolley right now an intense focus about him. Knows that this has a chance to be his best start of the year. And that hit him. Clipped the jersey as it went by. And with one out, Madrid heads down the first base. It sounded like it clipped the jersey. But uh, I can say it was a walk. Same perspective over the rest of the weekend. This is here with the pitch on off the inside corner to Easton Carmichael, the catcher. TCU looking for a double play ball. That throw in the dirt when I stopped by Curtis Byrne as he had to go down to his knees to smother it. Carmichael reached on a fielder's choice, scored a run back in the first. After reaching on the fielder's choice, he stole second base. Struck out all the way back in the first inning. So officially 0 for 2 in the game. Scored on the home run by Schneider back in the fourth inning. Which uh, is accounted for both runs that Oklahoma has on the board here tonight. Tolly again with a throw over to first base. And you can see Tolly just trying to slow things down. Bouncer towards third. Glove by Robinson. His only place to first. He gets it across in time. Nice play by Ryder Robinson. And that's the maturation of the freshman because he wasn't making that play in the first week of the season. Well, no, he doesn't make this play two weeks ago. And, and you see, he learned he's got to come up and play this one in front of the bag. If you sit back on this, there's a chance that this ball hits third base, and then it's just even more chaos 
out there. You see Robinson charging it. He's right on top of the bag itself. Gets it out of his hand quickly. That's learning the speed of a game against a great offensive player in Easton Carmichael. Outstanding play by the freshman Robinson over there at third. Pull foul. That went into the TCU dugout. Anthony McKenzie. 0 for 2. And he struck out twice, both times looking. Tolley goes to the outside corner, but misses. Tying run at second with two outs now for Oklahoma. We're in the top half of the sixth inning. Holy gets the strike call from home plate umpire Casey Moser. Trying to keep the Frogs in the lead through six. Just a foul coming off the facing of the upper deck. Next pitch will be the 100th pitch of the night for Peyton Tolley. Looking on a back to tonight. He leaves with the lead. Anthony Silva starts it off for the Horn Frogs here in the home half of the sixth inning, and he takes a strike. Tyson Witherspoon. Back to the mound here. Silver Bowen and Robinson for the Horn Frogs here in the sixth. Silver's had two good at bats, no hits tonight, but a couple of walks. Witherspoon right now able to command that slider pretty well, and he's got that mid 90s fastball as well. So definitely a difficult assignment for the Horn Frogs here in the middle innings. Foul. Okay. You can see Silva late on that 95 mile an hour fastball after seeing the 85 mile an hour slider. Well, that one back. And you can see the slider from, from Witherspoon. It's a tight one. There's not a whole lot of vertical depth to it, especially when it gets up around that belt. It's really going to flatten out a pitch like that. And Silva fouling it back. The best pitches when we've seen him have success already here, just through his first 18 pitches, when he starts it around the knees, then it's able to just dive down into the dirt. Went back to the fastball, and Silva was right on it, fouled it back. Yeah, you can see Silva still working through it a little bit at the plate right now. That's a pitch that we would see him deposit into a gap somewhere in the first couple weeks of the season. A lot of real estate down the left field line. Left fielder Pettis playing well off the line, not expecting Silva to pull it. And he takes strike three on a fastball over the inside corner. And this just happens every now and then. Just get frozen up by a pitch that's right over the plate. It's one of those fastballs, and just a four-seamer from Witherspoon says, come get it. And Silva looking out over the plate, potentially for another one of those spinners. But that's one that you have to just tip your cap, get beat by the pitcher, and we'll get him again next time out. Carson Bowen takes ball one. Bowen one for two, had a double in the right field corner back in the second, got as far as third. Fouled out to the first baseman, McKenzie, is last time up. So one for two for Bowen tonight. When as good a fastball as 
Witherspoon has, he's really relied more on the slider than the fastball. Goes to the fastball here, but misses. Witherspoon, 6'2", 205 out of Jacksonville, Florida, went to Northwest Florida State College before transferring in to Oklahoma. Obviously a live arm. Ford and sends that one all the way back to the backstop. Well, Carson Bowen goes down to first base with a one out walk. You can see just lost a little bit of control there in that at bat from Witherspoon. If you're Robinson, you're taking note of that here. Freshman coming back to the plate now had a sack fly in his first at bat. He got the scoring started for the Horned Frogs and walk back in the fifth. So still has yet to officially come to the plate here tonight, but we'll see how he handles a little bit of an up uptick in the velocity and the stuff from Witherspoon is trying to find it again right now. Had a good swing at that fastball, fouled it back. Well, Witherspoon, you mentioned it when he first came in the game. He has started. He's gone for as many as five innings. Most pitches he's thrown in any one game is 80, so it's not like he's one of those guys out of the Oklahoma bullpen who only comes in for an, a batter or two. He's a guy who can log some innings on the mound. A Robinson. Waiting, there goes Bowen, the pitch is spiked into the dirt. And Bowen will have a stolen base. And Bowen had that base stolen anyway. And then the wild pitch just made it a lot easier. And yeah, something's happened within the last few pitches here where Witherspoon's is trying to find the release point once again. This one skips. Takes a slider, it missed inside. And all of a sudden, Witherspoon is dialed in. Having problems with both pitches now, trying to find the strike zone. Took a little something off. That breaking ball got it over for a strike. It's two and two. It's not a bad take from Robinson. It's just a good pitch. That tight slider that's inside, probably going to jam you. Robinson able to lay off. That pitch that was off the plate outside. Looked like he tried to backdoor him with that one. It stayed outside, so now a full count on Ryder Robinson. Fought a fastball off to keep the count full of three and two. Starting to cool off a little bit here at Lupton Stadium. In the background, you can see people pulling out the blankets. The cold front to move through. Robinson swings and misses, and he's down on strikes. And a good pitch that time by Witherspoon as you really pulled the string on him. Now this was definitely the best breaking ball of the at bat. You see how much more depth he's got on this one. That tight spin. Doesn't necessarily pop out of the hand either. Robinson who did a nice job of fouling off a couple of tough pitches in the at bat. Not able to get to this one. And that's a big strikeout for Witherspoon to get the two outs. Chase Brunson at the plate now. He's off a pitch way outside. Oh. 
sequence and hits it high in the air to deep right field. Back goes Madrin at the fence. He camps and makes the catch right up against the wall as Brunson made a bid for a home run to right field, but it stayed in the ball. Ten strikeouts in a walk, 100 pitches. And you might have noticed on the, the TCU hats tonight, that the, uh, the players are wearing. There's a patch on the side of the hat there. You can see it right there. Good shot of it. Luke Warriors with the FW. That's for Frank Windigger. The flag also at half mast. Frank Windigger passed away earlier this week. He was the TCU head coach for 14 years from 1962 to 75. He was the youngest coach in history to win the Southwest Conference. His jersey's Retired and then he went on to be the athletic director here at TCU for 23 years before he retired in August of 1997 and uh, Frank Windiger big part of The history of TCU athletics Will be honored for the rest of the year with the patch on the TCU hats That ball smoked into left field sinking quickly nice sliding catch made by Logan Maxwell to take a base hit away from Michael Schneider So a nice defensive play out in left. Takes a, another potential hit away from Schneider who squares this up pretty good. Yeah, see this is just a low stinger from Schneider. Maxwell fortunate. He's aligned in a spot that allows him to get to this ball. So one up, one down to start the seventh. Jackson Nicholas, the second baseman at the plate. Takes up high. So no mentioned something else about Frank Windiger. The reason I'm doing TCU baseball is because of Frank Windiger. Back in uh, 96, I started doing some games. In 97, TCU went to the WAC, and Coach Brown and Win Frank Windiger asked if I would do the games, all the games, since they, the fans weren't able to travel to places like San Jose and Hawaii and whatnot. They wanted every game on the radio, which was something that was not done at the time, just selected games were on the radio, but of course in the Southwest Conference, most of the teams were in the local area, lined back through the middle. That's a base hit, Brunson over to cut it off quickly. Two good swings against Coyer. And uh, Frank Windiger and Lance Brown and I met, and we came to an agreement that I would do the games for a couple of years, and here I am. Another good swing off a of Collier here. So it's his fault that I'm stuck here with you is what you're saying. <laughs> That's right. A couple of good swings back to back by Snyder and Nicholas. Kendall Pettis takes the first pitch down and in. You gotta be careful with Nicholas over at first base. He will steal. He started to go on that first pitch put on the brakes. Boyer delivers the strike. And leaving things up at one and one. Time run aboard with one out. Almost had him. That was a close play over at first base. Somehow, Nicholas able to get a hand in ahead of the tag by Curtis Byrne. Yeah, get another look at the move and the play. When you're even leaning a little bit, sometimes it's tough to get back in there. But Nicholas able to get the hand in. Another line drive to center field for a base hit. Bobble by Brunson. And that's going to allow Nicholas to go all the way to third base. And those may be the three best swings we've seen all year off of Zachary Collier. Yeah, these are just three laser beams to start the top half of the seventh inning. And this is a mistake that'll you know, we'll see how the inning goes defensively for the Horn Frog. You see Brunson is looking up a little bit on this one, not seeing it into the glove, and that extra base allowing Nicholas to get himself to third, and now just with one out in the inning. He's 0 for 2 tonight. Takes a slider for a strike. 
TCU getting their bullpen busy after that mound visit and a couple of good swings off the car here by the Sooners. Ben Abel starting to throw for the Horn Frogs. Another good slider. And that buckled the knees of Frederick. And Collier, no stranger to these situations. And on his way to the 5 0 record so far this year, it's been some tough situations. A couple of bases loaded, nobody outs. Situations just like this. Little flare towards left field. Coming on is Logan Maxwell. He can't make the catch. It dunks in for a base hit, and the tying run will score as Nicholas crosses the plate to make it a 3-3 ball game. And the mistake by Brunson out in center field, which was logged as a fielding he error, allows that run to score. Nice. If he's at second base, he probably can't score on that. Yeah, you're not scoring on this ball from second base unless you take an uber-aggressive read on it. Now, Maxwell not really close to this ball, so maybe you get a read, maybe you don't, but either way, the game's tied up here in the seventh inning, and with Kirk Sarlos out, that'll be it for Zach Collier. New pitcher coming on for the Horn Frogs. And with what we've seen from, from TCU so far, the one you know, potential Achilles heel. Oh, that's been an outstanding start from a record perspective for the Horn Frogs at 15 and 2, 17 games into the year. But it's been the bullpen and throw down the second after the pitch was taken for a ball. Well, it was an interesting conversation for a couple of reasons. I thought, you know, number one, you don't see pitchers used like that. And, and, and he followed that up by saying, you know, a lot of times what you're doing is the manager or the coach is you're saying well I'm only going to put my guy in you know in, in this situation my you know back end bullpen guy in a situation where he can save a game Is that pitch missed inside he said but the, the truth of the matter is you save him for what like if you need him on Friday night for two innings you're going to save him in, you know even though the game may be tied like here you're going to save him for Sunday when you may not need him so he said you know I think We've decided that that's not how we're going to handle our bullpen. We're just going to manage it, you know, inning by inning, game by game. And Abel misses down low here, and all of a sudden he's behind 3-0. Carter Frederick, without a hit tonight, he's lined to second and grounded to second. Check that, it's a pinch hitter. Or, never mind, it's the nine <laughs> With us. Walked him and that will load the bases. So the base is loaded with only one out here. The go ahead run is at third. And now a very sticky situation for Ben Abel with the leadoff hitter, John Spikerman, coming up. And he's absolutely roped the ball three times tonight. One for three, had a single back in the first inning, but robbed of an extra base hit by Brunson in the third. And uh, Brunson had to make another nice catch on a hard hit baseball. The center field is last time up. This one's hit on the ground, back up the middle. Diving play made by Silva. They can't turn a double play, so the run scores to make it a 4-3 lead. But Silva does get the out at second base on a brilliant play up the middle by Anthony Silva. Well, the Sooners take the lead on this play, but what an outstanding job by Anthony Silva to keep this on the infield. And for the time being, at least, it saves a run. This one looked like it was headed up the middle all the way. Silva able to snare it. No real chance to turn the double play with as well as Spikerman runs. You see Kendall Pettis coming home to give the Sooners the lead four to three now, but could have been more damage done without the spectacular defensive play up the middle. And the umpires are going to take a look at this over at first base. 
This is just a brilliant play here by Silva up the middle. I didn't think he had it when it took the big hop, and the TCU fans got excited. The team was coming off the field, but all he said was the call stands. So the runners out at second base. We knew that. And then the runner is at first base is safe. Yeah, not, not, not a great delivery of the uh, of the decision, but you get another look at the play here. And it looked like it, su it surprises the base runner that Silva even gets a glove on this ball, so you're not anticipating the need to slide into second base. And now Chatnier and company are standing around. They're, they're confused. The home plate umpire Casey Moser's call after he came out wasn't exactly clear. He pointed to second base and said out. Well, everybody knew that was the case. They thought he was talking about the interference. And that's why everybody cheered, but that was not what he indicated as he pointed to first and then said safe. So after the delay, here we go. That pitch is in for a strike. Well, after all is said and done, it's a 4-3 ball game with two outs and runners at the corners for Oklahoma. Spikerman's over at first base. And at third is Frederick, the designated hitter. Madrin one for two. He's got a single and a walk. A belt deals, cut on and missed. Abel trying to keep it a one-run ball game. There goes the runner. This one's hit back up the middle and through for a base hit. One run score. Spikerman's going to head to third. He'll stop there. And it's now a 5-3 ball game. And Oklahoma getting some good swings off of the TCU bullpen here. An RBI base hit. And that's a huge insurance run. You know, we talked at the top of the broadcast about how good both of these teams have been offensively and at least so far it's Oklahoma that's having the big breakout inning three runs in now in the top of the seventh and they've been really teeing off on the combination of Zach Collier and Ben Abel thus far. After Peyton told he went the first six innings and struck out ten Sooners. Three runs on four hits and a big error in the inning by the one frogs there's a swing and a miss and again that's a pitch that's up that breaking ball up around the belt not where a belt wants to live eighth man to come to the plate here Easton Carmichael With runners at first and third two way throw over to first base and they've got to be careful Spikerman really can run over at third base, and he would not hesitate to take off if he thought he could make it home on a throw over to first base. Especially with the left-hander on the mound, as Abelt really doesn't have a clear look at him. In the air, towards the line in right field, that's going to dunk in for a base hit. Another run will score. And it's now a 6-3 ball game. And the hits continue for the Sooners. Now Spikerman comes across. Runners remain at first and third. That is another hit. And here comes Dave Lawn out of the dugout. Well, you see, this is a breaking ball that starts well away from Easton Carmichael. But he just sticks the bat out and is able to land this one just inside the foul line. Down in Ryland during Peyton Toldy's time on the mound, but they've really taken advantage of the TCU bullpen here in the seventh inning. And still an out to get for the Horn Frogs. Anthony McKenzie at the plate. Went around as he tried to hold up on that breaking ball in the dirt. Kenzie hitless tonight. Hits it sharply back up the middle, fielded by Silva, who underhands over this last third of the ball game. Nine outs for the Horn Frogs remain in this game. It'll be Boyers in the top of the order for TCU. Boyer 
Bears takes low for ball one. Well, the Frogs had some chances early in the game to score some extra runs, just couldn't do it. And now they find themselves down. Boyers has a single tonight. He's also had a sacrifice bunt, takes a fastball for a strike. Velocity down just a little bit. That fastball just 93 miles an hour. Still good velocity, but not the 96, 97 we saw when Witherspoon first entered the game back in the fifth inning. Boyers had a good rip, fouled it straight back out of play. And removed the count to one and two. Well, TCU's been able to come from behind this year. Foul back again. Opening weekend, it came back from two six run deficits late in the game. You don't like to chase the game in the final third of it. Difficult to do. At least game in and game out. But again, you don't have to get all three runs back if you're TCU in this inning. You just got to start to chip away just a little bit. And give yourself a chance. Boyers lays off. Looks like a breaking ball and just never did anything. Just the 30 or 40th pitch, rather. Did he go around? He did. And Boyers is down on strikes to start the seventh for the Horn Frogs. You ready to see this is a good tight slider in from Witherspoon. He starts it just a little bit below the belt. Boyers starts the swing thinking it's a fastball. And you see he recognizes the spin, but it's a little bit too late. You look from the side, and he goes around just a tick too far. Ron Whiting, the third base umpire, confirming that he goes around. Breaking ball for a strike to Chatagnier. He's in jeopardy of seeing his on-base streak come to an end here. 0 for 3 tonight. He's not been on base at all. Popped to short, flew out to right, grounded to first. And he's in the hole, nothing in two, and he's... Looked out of sorts tonight at the plate. He just hasn't been comfortable. Here's the 0-2. Missed with the breaking ball. This group certainly likes that slider. But he's able to keep it down. Tough pitch to hit for the Horn Frogs so far in this outing. But shot he lays off. Pulled a fastball to the glove side away. DC looking for some base runners here with one out in the seventh. He went after that fastball at 95. It looked to be out of the strike zone, but with two strikes, you just got to try to foul it off. You see he's staying in there, and the timing's just been a tick off for the last week or so, and sometimes it just takes one. It takes one good swing. Good take by Chatagnier on that pitch down. Full count. That's the pitch that got Boyers a minute ago. But now a full count as Shotney tries to find a way on base for the Horn Frogs. If you're going to come back, it has to start with somebody getting on base. And he fouls the fastball off. Shotney battling Witherspoon here. Another 3-2 pitch come into Peyton Chatagnier. Oh. 
in the air deep to right field back goes Madrin at the fence he turns around and shy of the warning track is able to haul it in for the out of success and consistent swing that we saw through the first couple of weeks that hit Logan Maxwell so he'll go down to first base and Maxwell clipped by that pitch goes down to first base with two outs and Curtis Byrne will be the batter. See, this one just gets away from Witherspoon. Looks like it's off that front elbow or forearm. Just clips enough of Maxwell. Here you really get a look at it. You see the slider in. It's right off the top of that elbow. Fortunately, it didn't hit straight on the bone there, especially when you've got no, no elbow guard that you see so many of the guys go into now. Potential to be a dangerous play. Byrne takes the first pitch low and outside, ball wide. Curtis with a couple of hits. Singled up the middle in the fourth, singled to right in the fifth, struck out all the way back in the first. Up in the count now, 2-0. Check the swing. They appeal down to first base umpire Michael Banks, who says he was able to hold up. So the count now three and oh. There's the strike. Curtis taken all the way on that pitch. He'll be ready to hit here three and one. the ball four that appeared to be above the letters now it's full three and two 95 miles an hour that looks pretty good up there but it's impossible almost to get on top of so with the count four Logan Maxwell will take off on the pitch they elect to hold him on here but he'll still go as soon as the pitch is delivered there he goes strike three called on the outside corner and Curtis Byrne, strike, unable to do the job tonight, is going to look at Abelt leaning on the rail. He goes two-thirds of an inning, allows two hits, one run. It was earned. A walk, no strikeouts, 13 pitches for the sophomore Ben Abelt tonight. The book also closed on Zach Collier. A third of an inning, three runs. And so uh, both of those guys in unfamiliar territory as they have uh, broken two of the more successful arms for the Horn Frogs coming out of that bullpen, but not tonight. Is both of them roughed up by the Sooner offense? You know, and this by no means is, is TCU throwing in the towel either. Most yellow guy that's had success over his first few outings as a Horn Frog, especially with the fastball. We'll see if he's able to come in. If you're if you're Mose yellow coming in this ball game, you've got to keep the Sooners at six and allow your offense a chance to try and figure something out against Witherspoon on the mound on the other side. Nine men came to the plate for the Sooners last inning. Michael Schneider, who led the inning off, takes a strike. He led off last inning with a rocket to left field. A sliding catch was made by uh, Logan Maxwell in left. He's also homer tonight. One for three officially in the game, but he's hit the ball hard every time he's been up. The ball in the strike. Eight hits for the Sooners tonight. Mosiello deals and misses for ball two. Three-one 
count now on the dangerous Michael Schneider. There's a strike called on the outside corner. Schneider trying to steal a ball four. Kind of a wry smile on his face. Didn't agree with the call from home plate umpire Casey Mosier. He thought it was outside, but. On the ground, right side. Shotye gobbles it up and throws him out. One up, one down here to start the eighth. That's a nice job, Moziello, staying in the count. Close pitch to get to three and two, and then you're able to get the ground ball to Chatigny for the first out. Keep the leadoff man off the base pads. Jackson Nicholas, the second baseman, coming up. He got everything started for the Sooners last inning. And the base hit up the middle. And he's hit by the pitch here. We'll go down to first base. Hitting Nicholas and he's trying to walk that off. That's a breaker that just gets away from Moziello and really one that he just tugged on a little bit, held on to a little too long. And there's not really anywhere that you can go as a left hand hitter in that instance. Kendall Pettis coming to the plate. Had a base hit last inning. Shows bunt here. That pitch goes all the way back to the backstop. You know, a hit batter and a wild pitch, and there's another runner in scoring position for the Sooners. And we talked about it, you talked about it earlier in the game, that these games always seem to come down to who makes the fewest mistakes. And last inning, TCU made a, a couple of mistakes and didn't make some quality pitches. And, counts that they needed to and Oklahoma's taking advantage of them. Good breaking ball from Moziello. Sooners have won the last two series against TCU. Looking to go four at home in conference play. And one thought you got off to that Improbable 13 and 0 start. It really sort of hit a speed bump here. Losing two out of three to Kansas last week. Came back with a big win on Tuesday night. TC's won two in a row, but uh, in danger of going to one and three in Big 12 play. Three one count on Pettis with a runner out at second base. Ball four. And all of a sudden, Moziello got the ground ball to Schottenhead to start the inning. He's hit a batter and now walked one. Necessarily earned that benefit of the doubt yet. So, you know, the message internally is you know, make sure that if, if they're going to produce any runs, any more runs in this ball game, that they're hitting their way to it. Force the action, see if we can get a double play ball and get ourselves back into the dugout. That's the message on the mound during that meeting. Moziello misses with the first offering to Frederick. And he throws one all the way back to the backstop. And both runners will advance. Another wild pitch. That's the second one in this inning by Moziello. That's something we haven't seen from him. Usually his command has been pretty good. Gonzalez looking on with some frustration from the TCU dugout as his bullpen has faltered here tonight. Infield in for the Horn Frogs. They have to try and cut the run at the plate here. And if Moziello's got a strikeout pitch, he needs to find it in this at bat. Well, that was it that he just went to there as the slider that was down. 
So he's in a 2-1 count now. If he can find a way to get the two strikes and get back to that pitch, he's got a chance. Line towards left field. This is going to be caught, but a run will score. As tagging from third and coming home is Nicholas to make it a 7-4 ball game. And you said it at the top of the inning. He really had to try and keep it a three-run deficit. Now it takes a bases-loaded situation in a grand slam to tie the game up. Sacrifice fly by Frederick and another good at bat by a sooner. And he goes back to the slider and you see Frederick making the adjustment. He goes down and gets that ball, hits this one hard. And Maxwell able to range over, make the play. Just he's so, so far back into the outfield, no chance to make that throw. And it's another RBI for the Sooners. Sixth run batted in for Frederick on the year. And over the last two innings, they have scored five runs. One Frog's last played in a run back in the fifth inning. They took a 3-2 lead at the time. But since then, it's been all Oklahoma. In the air, tough play for Maxwell as he races after it, makes the catch. And really kind of erasing a, a season night for Peyton Tolley. Drilled in the left field by Jack Brassier as he jumps on the first pitch. And Peyton Tolley with a career high 10 strikeouts in the game, left with the lead. But uh, it's been all Oklahoma since then. Well, if you're going to start somewhere, this is how you do it. It's a nice swing by Basir to get things going and taking advantage of a fastball that's left out over the plate by Kyson Witherspoon. There have not been that many opportunities. Just three hits that he's scattered now in his three-plus innings of work. Anthony Silva at the plate now. Tried to check his swing. He was able to. He took the pitch for ball one. Silva has walked twice and struck out, officially 0 for 1. Well, we've talked about it before in situations similar to this. If you're TCU, you can't think about the fact you're four runs down. You just got to go one step at a time. It starts with Brasier getting that leadoff base hit, and now it's up to Silva to just try and pass the baton to the next guy. You can't think about the mountain you have to climb. You just got to think about putting one foot in front of the other. There's a strike. It's two and one. that fastball but fouled it back and leaving things up with two balls and two strikes you know, on the other side of things too for skip johnson and this oklahoma coaching staff you know that this horn frog team has come back and then played some wild baseball games so far this season you know that you're trying to not only hold tcu off but get back in the dugout and put on some more insurance in the top half of the ninth inning silva fouls it further along down the right field line now Skip Johnson's is thinking about outs now. He knows he needs six of them right now. You see him relaying the pitches. With a little walkie-talkie. Sooners looking to go 4-0 and oh in Big 12 play to start the season. Strike three call to Anthony Silva. This is the second at bat in a row that we've seen Silva just stood up by a fastball. And it's just an excellent pitch. Nothing too fancy about it. Four seamer that's maybe a shade on the lower half of the strike zone, but it's got the heart of the plate. Carson Bowen at the plate now with one out and a runner at first base. Takes a slider for a strike. And Witherspoon has just been dealing with that good fastball and the slider and he kind of pitches backwards he uses that slider to set up the fastball that he just got 
Silva with a moment ago. Goes to the fastball here. Ooh. Limbo being done by Carson Bowen. One for two for Bowen. He's got a double. He's also walked. Fouled out his other time to the plate. Up in the count here now. Two and one. Lucky Skip Johnson had tonight. He had Davis. He only went four, but he's got Kyson Witherspoon, who's been in the game since then. A guy who has started and gone as many as five innings. Swing and a miss. So this is not unfamiliar territory for him. He's in his uh, fourth inning work here. Pitch count now up to 62. The most he's thrown in any one game, 80. So he's still got a ways to go to reach that plateau. And he strikes out Carson Bowen back to back strikeouts for Witherspoon. They're two way after a good start to the inning for TCU. Frogs are in danger of wasting a leadoff single. Yeah, and that's six now on the night for Kyson Witherspoon. This is just a fastball that he pulls a little bit off the plate and it's up. And you see Bowen, another one where he's going fishing outside. He's been susceptible to that pitch over the last week or so. In the dirt. Stayed right at the feet of the catcher Carmichael. And Basir started and then stopped. And with the four-run lead, Carmichael did a good job. He just picked the baseball up. He wasn't going to risk a throw. There's no point in throwing down there. Might have had a chance at Basir, who had wandered pretty far off the bag. Ryder Robinson up in the count, 2-0. Thompson with a sacrifice fly and an RBI. He's also walked and scored. One for one officially. He struck out his last time up. Nine strikeouts for this Sooner pitching staff tonight. Most of them, as you mentioned, from Witherspoon. And he's ahead here, two and two, or even two and two. Well, Robinson was one of those victims back in the sixth inning, and it was a slider that was underneath his hands. We'll see two two if that's what Witherspoon goes back here, trying to get the freshman to swing over the top of another one. Little cue shot back up the middle, gloved by the shortstop who throws to first for the final out of the inning. For TCU, no runs on a hit. They strand a man. We'll head to the ninth inning. Oklahoma does give up a run. Walked one, didn't strike out anybody. Hit a batter, threw two wild pitches out of his 19, and it was not the kind of an outing that Andrew Moziello was uh, hoping for. And TCU bullpen tonight really faltering after a great start from Peyton Tolley. He left with the lead, but um, it's been a five run last two innings for the Sooner Ball Club. And they've done it by hitting. They've done it by using their speed on the base pass after getting some free passes. First pitch. To John Spikerman taken for ball one. Parker clips the corner, keeping things up with a ball and a strike. Top of the order for Oklahoma here in the ninth. Spikerman, one for four, had a base hit back in the first inning, but that doesn't really tell the story. 
reached another fielder's choice and scored in the four run seventh, but in between time he flew out twice to center field on balls that were just absolutely crushed. Took a great play by Brunson to go back almost to the warning track and leap to make a catch and then had to come in and make a running sliding catch on a sinking line drive. The two times he's been kept off the bases. Fouls that one back. Full count. Well, for TCU cannot afford to give up any more runs. You're already down four, which means there's a tremendous amount of work to try and do in the bottom half of the ninth inning. Popped up. Foul territory. Right field, Boyers in foul grounds, able to make the catch. So probably the weakest contact of the night by Spikerman. That was a nice job by Parker getting in on Spikerman and just another example of Luke Boyers being able to range really far from true right field over into foul territory. A lot of foul territory here on both sides of the field at Lupton Stadium. One of the biggest catalysts for Oklahoma tonight has been the guy at the plate right now, Bryce Madden. He takes the strike. Madden has been right in the thick of it. Officially two for three, struck out back in the first inning. Since then he has singled twice and walked. And he lines one in the center field for another base hit. Ninth hit of the game for the Sooners. Third hit for Madrid. He's been right on everything that TC has been throwing at him. That's yeah, just really simple and a nice piece of hitting. You see, there's a fastball at the lower part of the zone. He just goes down and gets it. He's flat through it, pulling the hands in and able to line it right back where it came from. Three for four night for Madrid. Madrid, a senior. Pitch missed down low and outside to Easton Carmichael. He had a base hit his last time up. That's his only hit tonight. One for four. Drove in a run with that base hit. Throw over to first base and Madrid able to get back. He's not stolen a base yet this year. But I wouldn't be surprised here in the ninth inning to see him go. With Oklahoma hat holding the four run lead. Another throw over, and that one was almost thrown away. Curtis Byrne had to climb the ladder to stop that one from going down the right field line. The TCU has not been able to take advantage of what few opportunities they've had. And Oklahoma certainly has. With runners on base, TCU just three of 16. For Oklahoma, they're 5 of 50. That's a 3.33 batting average. With runners in scoring position, they're even better. 4 for 9. TCU just 1 for 6. It's something we've seen all year long from this home frog offense. To be able to generate runs once they get opportunities has not been there for TCU tonight. Yeah, they really haven't been able to just go back to the well at will as we've seen them been able to do so far through the first 17 ball games. There goes the runner. It's cued off the end of the bat. Foul. The runner will retreat back to first base, and the count will move to a ball and two strikes as Madrin heads back to first after taking off. Pitch by Parker, got him swinging. Two outs in the inning. You see Madrid talking to, or uh, Carmichael talking to McKenzie, who's coming to the plate. I see when Parker's going, he's got three plus pitches. The fastball can play into the mid 90s. He's got this big slider as well. This 
You see a breaking ball that he gets Carmichael with, and then a changeup that also gets a lot of swings and misses when it's on. It's just a matter of putting it all together consistently. The two outs and a runner over at first base. First baseman Anthony McKenzie comes to the plate. That's the first pitch for ball one. One for four for McKenzie with three strikeouts tonight. You gotta hand it to the Sooners. Tonight, they were frustrated by Peyton Tolley in the first six innings of this game. The only two runs they scored was on the two-run home run. But they hung around and continued to battle. Once they got into the TCU bullpen, they've been able to really string some offense together. Yeah, you've got to just stay the course and sometimes just grind it out through your starter. That's why trying to even have long at bats elevating pitch, pitch counts even if you're not necessarily tacking on runs early in the ball game obviously the Sooners got the two run homer by Snyder in the fourth inning that gave them the lead not a whole lot of offensive output other than that but they got a great start from Davis on their end and they were able to find that separation here over the last couple of innings and then the great bullpen job by Kyson Witherspoon See if he comes back out for the bottom half of the ninth inning. Runner goes. The pitch is swung on and missed. Way down the second, not in time. It's a stolen base for Madron. That's his first of the year. Second of the ball game for the Sooners in the 27th. This Bowen throw is late. If you're thinking about Witherspoon. He's only thrown 72 pitches, so below his season high of 80. We'll have to see if he comes out for the ninth with a four-run lead. Swing and a miss. Good pitch by Caden Parker. But nothing since then. And Witherspoon's been doing it with the combination of the fastball and that breaking ball that you see misses up to Brunson for ball one. Brunson, Boyers, and Chatagnier for the Horn Frogs, but they'll have to send more than just those guys to the plate as you see what Witherspoon's done tonight. An outstanding outing for the right hander. Brunton 0 for 2 of the walk tonight. And there's a strike. TCU has not lost at home yet this year. They're 10-0 here at Lupton Stadium, but it's going to take a monumental comeback for them to improve on that record tonight. Brunson fouls it. Now leaving things up with two balls and two strikes. But just like we talked about last inning, Connor, you can't be thinking about the deficit here. You just got to think about getting on and passing the baton to the next guy. Brunson with a little pop up to the right side. Going back is Nicholas, and he makes the catch on the outfield grass. One away in the bottom half of the ninth. And another good pitch from Witherspoon, who's made a number of them here tonight. Now you've really got to credit the combination of Witherspoon and Davis on the mound for the Sooners just have not allowed the Horn Frogs to have much offense with traffic on the bases. TCU just one for six with runners in scoring position, two for nine with two outs in innings. Those are both areas where they've excelled over the course of the season. Luke Boyers takes ball one. And just six hits for the Horn Frogs and they've kind of been scattered. They had five of the six through the first five innings. So just one hit allowed since the fifth inning. So as Oklahoma has taken the lead on TCU, the Horn Frog offense is completely stalled against Witherspoon, who's been dominating. 
and in line for the win here. There's a strike on the inside corner. It's two and one. for the loss here. His first loss of the year is TC can't now come back in the bottom half of the ninth inning. Warriors <laughs> fouls another fastball off the right, uh, left side. Well, Boyer's doing a nice job of just spoiling some pitches here and making Witherspoon work. He's up over that 80 pitch mark that you've been noting. There are a couple of arms just throwing and probably staying ready down in the senior bullpen. Obviously, Skip Johnson would love to see his right-hander finish this one out. Boyer can't hold up. He's down on strikes. And TCU's down to their final out of the night. Yeah, and it's fitting for Witherspoon. It's just another great breaking ball from him. You see he starts this right above the knee and just snaps it off. And for the second time, it's Boyers going chasing on that slider down. I see it's just so frustrating as a hitter when you've got a pitch that's that good you're trying to go against. And you know it's outside the strike zone. You just can't hold up in the event that it's a fastball. Seven strikeouts for Witherspoon since entering the game. Back in the fifth. We came into the game after the first two men reached base via the walk. In the fifth inning, they eventually came around to score. They were credited against Davis. And he has not given up a run or really much of anything to the Horn Frogs. They have not had much traffic on the base pass against him. What little traffic there's been. We had a walk in the sixth, a hit batter in the seventh, a base hit to start the eighth, but he's come right back and slammed the door, not allowed another base runner in those innings. And he's trying to finish this one off here as he falls behind a shot in the A3-0. And Chatney draws a walk. So here in the ninth, Chatney keeps his on base streak alive, but TC's going to need at least a couple of more guys to get on base to give themselves a puncher's chance. A line drive back in the third, drove in two with a base hit to right field in the fifth, hit by a pitch his last time in. They go shot in the A. He's going to take second base and defensive indifference. He's run meaningless to Oklahoma. One for three officially for Maxwell. You can tell he's seen the ball well. He's not offering at those pitches. He's just been the most consistent offensive performer for the Horn Frogs, and it's been steady. See the batting average up to 439 for Maxwell, 429 rather for